Welcome back, Photographic Arts Council. We're happy to have Pablo Lopez Luz with us today. Um, I want to quick, um, in, in case anyone is new to PAC, I want to just welcome you to um, this gathering and direct you to our website at paclosangeles.com. You can learn more about what we're doing and sign up for our mailing list there. Very happy to have you. Um, and want to thank our members for um, their continued support while we've moved everything that we do online as has everyone else. I know you're having a lot of screen time right now, but um, it's gonna be worth it, I promise. So um, Pablo Lopez Luz is an artist from Mexico City. Um, and some of us uh, in PAC met him in, when PAC did a trip to Mexico a couple of years ago, and we enjoyed a, a uh, visit with his, to his studio and a chat with him. Um, he does a lot of work with landscape and um, is in a number of amazing collections and has had a very interesting career. And so without me blathering on any longer, I will let him show, uh, show you what we have to offer today. So I'm gonna go away. And then uh, after the presentation, I will come back, look at the Q&A box at the bottom of the screen. You can uh, submit your questions there and we'll have a conversation after the presentation, okay? Take it away. Uh, hello, everyone. Thank you for joining me this Friday afternoon. And thank you, Paula, very much for the invitation to, for this um, talk today. Uh, this is a little bit strange because I'm staring at my name and at my photographs. I can't see anyone. So <laughs> I'll try to make this as fluent as possible. And uh, I asked Paula that if I, at some point, uh, get mixed up together or something. She can jump in and ask me something or if she thinks that I'm maybe missing anything, then I can maybe talk about it. So I'll, it's a little bit strange to just stare at my screen, but here we go. So again, thank you everyone for joining. Uh, I basically made, made two divisions for the conversation today of, of my work. So I titled the conversation Landscapes and Stones. And I'm going to talk about six different projects. And I'm, I'm, I'm gonna have to move a little bit quickly so that I can run through them all before the answer and the question and answer session. So it's, I, I divided them into different subjects, landscapes and stones. So the first project that I'm gonna talk about, and this is not working, it was working before. Okay, there we go. Uh, the first project is Terrazzo. This is my very first project. Um, I started working on this project while I was still living in New York City. Uh, I did my master's degree at New York, uh, New York University from 2004 to 2006. And I guess that's the first time, I mean, I'd been involved with photography before that. I was working with photography before that, but this was the first time that I was actually, uh, or that I had to actually think about a project that made sense and uh, a project that I could work on and that could maybe uh, mean something in the future. So when I was living in New York, I kept traveling to Mexico maybe uh, three or four times a year. And after looking at uh, a lot of photography, of course, in school and before that, um, particularly two books that kind of opened my vision to photography, which were uh, Jean-Marc Bustamante, the French artist. Uh, Jean-Marc Bustamante's Tableau, that's a project that he photographed in the suburbs of Barcelona. And then Louis Valls, uh, who probably, yeah, you all know who he is, and his book Candlestick Point in particular. I guess that was the first time that I saw two projects that uh, dealt with the idea or with the subject of the periphery of the city in like a very straightforward and very even poetic manner. So as I kept traveling back to Mexico, I was drawn towards the urban landscape of the outskirts or the periphery of Mexico City too. Uh, of course, it's a very different city than uh, Barcelona or, or uh, Los Angeles, I think, and the point. Um, but yeah, I, I, I thought it would be interesting to talk about specific time the specific uh, society that was living in Mexico City at that time and talk about Mexicans living in the 20th century in this huge city with 22 or 
24, 25 million inhabitants and how the landscape of that city looks like and how the landscape is transformed by this uh, society and by this uh, overgrowth happening in the, in the city. So these are mostly photographs of the periphery of Mexico City, different sites. Uh, this is the main highway to Cuernavaca and to Acapulco. The, I'm going back one photograph. This is the, uh, one of the new, which before we used to be like a suburban area up in the Mex northern part of Mexico City, which is now like a huge city also, or just a co huge continuation of the city. And I guess I was all, all at, at that time I was also interested in or influenced by the new topographic exhibition, which I didn't see live, but that, that I could see in uh, catalogs or, or in the web. So I guess it was that genre or that sto history of photography dealing with the urban landscape that I wanted to be a part, part of. But then at the same time, uh, Mexico has a long tradition of, especially in the 20th century, even before that, of landscape painters, uh, Dr. Atul, for example, or Jose Maria Velasco, who are in a way uh, depicting these same landscapes, but hundreds of years before. Um, so in a way, it was also me trying to work with the same subject or trying to insert myself in that uh, pictorial or that artistic history of Mexico. Um, since I was a kid, I've been pretty much uh, directly involved with the world of Mexican art also because my father is an art gallerist who has a, a really beautiful photography collection, but he started working with painters. So for the maybe the first 20, 25 years of his career, he worked mostly with painters. So I grew up looking at painting and I grew up looking at these landscape painters. So in a way, that's one of the biggest influences too. Um, and in a way I was continuing also not only the tradition, but the history of the city. Because of course, this landscape uh, of uh, the Valle de Mexico or the Mexican, the Valley of Mexico City looks a lot, lot different in 2006 than it looked uh, years before, you know, like hundreds of years before. And then as I was photographing uh, the city from the periphery, like the photographs before, I was always photographing from the street. I was uh, finding high vantage points or high, high points, maybe going up mountains, sometimes walking, sometimes, like most of the times in the car, just driving around trying to find like these high vantage, vantage points. And at some point I realized that this specific landscape, this city that kept growing day by day, year by year, was very difficult to, to show from the street view. So uh, thanks to a collector friend of mine who, who, who had access to a small plane, uh, I was able to start pho photographing the city from the air. So these are maybe the photographs that are the best known from this project. And uh, usually people think that this project is only an aerial photography project, but it, it wasn't really. It was more like the end of the project or the closing of the project were these aerial views, which are probably the most popular and sometimes I even regard it as an aerial photographer, which I actually didn't do that much. So this is, yeah, what the landscape of 22 million people looks like, I guess. And yeah, it's a landscape that keeps growing year by year with a lot of uh, social political issues, of course, ecologic issues too. And I guess that's also one of the reasons why this project has, uh, you know, gone a little bit beyond the boundaries of, of Mexico. Uh, so again, that was the first project that I worked on. And then right after I finished working on that project, or maybe at the end of that project, I received the grant, uh, from the cultural council here in Mexico to work on a different project. And I was a little bit tired of working in, in Mexico City. So I was a little bit tired of working uh, the urban landscape, being inside this urban landscape, which is always a little bit uh, dangerous, even now maybe more than back in 2006, but 
it's not the most comfortable scenario to be photographing to get out of a car or or have a backpack with the tripod set the tripod and i guess i was also tired of just driving around so much and i decided to go the other way um there were a lot of references for this kind of landscape but most of them are maybe uh, european paintings that i had also seen as a child maybe when i traveled or in books that my father showed me and uh, i was drawn toward the naturalistic landscape but how this landscape looks today or how it used to look in 2007. so i started traveling to different states in mexico mostly the states where there's a like the southern states where there's like a uh, jungle or um, rain, rain, uh, what's it called? Well, and, and photographing maybe in the same, with the same strategy as painters would have uh, painted their paintings also centuries ago, but always including the element of people. So that's what would bring it back to today. I guess the landscape itself would maybe reference the history of naturalistic painting, but then when you have people and you can tell that these people are from these decades, then I guess that's what brings it to today. So, so yeah, again, going back to the tradition of painting, the tradition of landscape painting, but trying to, 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 to make it my own, trying to, to have my own eye and my own uh, subject matter to, to, to show, I guess. And it's also part of my, and it also referenced a lot my personal history growing up in a gallery and spending most of our free time in museums or with painters at the painters' studios. Uh, yeah, back in the day when I was growing up, it was mostly painting and then maybe there was a little bit of relationship with other, with, with photographers, particularly maybe Graciela Turbide, whom I met very young and who I would consider my, my teacher, even though she was, she never actually brought me in as a pupil. It was more like learning the craft by seeing her work and seeing her actual photographs and see how she was working day to day. Uh, and this is a photograph that I usually don't show in this uh, series because it's before that, but it's one of the first photographs that I, that I photographed that, I, that was exhibited at some point or that was published at some point. And it's part of that landscape also. And then these are like a couple of photographs that I did after the Natura project. So this is 2012. This is in Ecuador. And this is uh, another rainforest in, in, it says Colombia, but it's not in Colombia. It's in, uh, in Bolivia. And one of the things that I keep doing with my projects is that even though they're considered closed or done, Sometimes I just keep working on them whenever there's an opportunity. Mostly when I'm working on something else and I go across something that could maybe help the project to grow. And so I sometimes keep adding up images and also thinking about like future exhibitions or whatever can happen in five, 10 years where the projects can be shown in a different manner. So I've been doing this uh, series of rainforests or jungles, this series, which are, large landscapes and whenever i encounter one of these uh beautiful scenarios then i try to photograph it and if it's interesting then i include it into the natura project even though there's no people even though i'm breaking the rules of the original project also there's a i mean i guess you can see it but there's the information for the work uh down in the screen so i can give an idea of what size sizes the prints are shown at uh, whenever they're shown because it varies a lot from one project to the other. Uh, so after 2009, I decided that I, that I wasn't going to work uh, on landscape projects anymore, and particularly aerial landscape projects anymore. It was just, I had been doing it. There's, there's a couple of other projects that I did between after those two first projects. So I was a little bit tired of working and just with landscape and also being considered only a landscape photographer. So I decided that I wasn't gonna do any more aerial photographs or any more landscape photographs for a little while. And then I did it again. And it was more because an opportunity also arose thanks to a collector also at that time. 
And um, it, it came out in a very uh, simple conversation. We were having, having a like breakfast uh, in a hotel. And this, this um, collector is from Monterrey, very close to the US-Mexico border. And I showed him a photograph that I had done years before in Tijuana, where you could see the US-Mexico border. It was, a, it was a landscape photography, but there was a line running through the landscape that pretty much bisect, dissected the, the landscape in two. And I told him that I had at that time wanted to do a project about the US-Mexico border, the symbol of the border and the border as landscape. And he said, well, why, why did you not do it? And I said, well, I didn't have the means to do it because I couldn't do it from the ground because it wouldn't have been like a, such an interesting project because most of that land that you can access is pretty straight. Uh, so he said, what did you need? And I said, well, I needed a helicopter. He said, well, I can get you a helicopter. And I said, oh, well, I guess I can do the project then. But it was, uh, I mean, I, I didn't really plan ahead for the project. Uh, so, he's, so I just flew to Monterrey, got on a helicopter, flew to the border. I didn't realize that it would take me three hours in a helicopter to get to the border. And then that I only, I only had seven hours of flight. And the day was rainy. It was very cloudy. So you pretty much couldn't do any photographs. I was shooting with film like I always do. So I couldn't really change any settings in the camera that would allow me to maybe deal with that uh, fogginess. So by the time we, were, we came back to Monterrey, I had no work at all. Like literally I knew that I was getting off the helicopter without any good uh, photographs. That taught me a very good lesson. And it also forced me to find my own means to do the project because I, I, I had told the collector that I would give him prints in exchange for, for the help. So then I really planned ahead. I checked the weather. I also had to mess, like, make, like, see wh where I could find the helicopter that would do that flight and that would actually fly on the side of the border that was the opposite side of the border that I had been shooting or not the opposite side but the op but the opposite section of the border so i finally got everything together got the money got the helicopter and the idea was to photograph the border where there's an actual fence or where there's an actual wall or that's where, where the river is not the actual border because after el paso texas the rest of the border at least back in a couple of years ago the, the border was actually the river. There, there weren't that many walls or fences. So, I went, so my idea was to photograph the border that had actually been decided by man, that had been uh, drawn by man, even though the border changed three times. Uh, I was interested in that and actually like the gesture of someone drawing a line on a map and deciding that this would be us and this would be them and what that meant and what that entailed as a social, politically, economic gesture or reality. So what we're looking at is actually the landscape of the US-Mexico border. So the line that you see running through is sometimes a highway and sometimes it's a fence or a wall. Uh, and I mean, so, I mean, I also wanted to actually see what the border looked like because it, this project was done pre-Trump pre-Trump times, it, the, the book actually came out at Perry Photo when some of us that actually met there learned that Trump had, had been elected the new president. So this was before that. But for Mexico, the wall has always been a very important symbol for Mexicans because of what the wall entails and what the division entails, drug trafficking, uh, human trafficking, uh, sex trafficking, uh, so many things. And then also Mexicans trying to cross the border since the border exists pretty much to try to have a better, um, better means for their families. So, I mean, when you're born in Mexico, you, 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 you learn about the border very quickly and it's always a subject matter that comes up uh, frequently, especially if you travel to small towns, like very small towns, where you sometimes see constructions that are maybe a little bit more modern or that maybe cost a little bit more and you start wondering where that money came from. And then that's when you learn also that 
the money from the migrants is coming into Mexico and that's how they're building their houses, no, or their towns pretty much. So anyways, uh, I also wanted to see the border uh, through my own eyes. You know, I wanted to actually see what the border looks like, what the border is. And then it actually became even more important because of uh, Trump's politics and his idea of building a wall. When you actually know what the wall looks like or what the landscape looks like and how difficult it is to actually build a very, very uh, hard and tight, uh, tall wall in this landscape. So I flew from the, it took me three different flights in a helicopter. The first one was a very long flight from Tijuana to uh, El Paso, well, to Ciudad Juarez and then to El Paso and then back to San Diego. But we were hit by a very strong storm when we were crossing Arizona. So we had to stop, we had to land and stay there for three days while the storm passed. And then, so, and then we flew three days uh, after that, the rest of the trip, which was from Tucson to, to San Diego. So, and, I, and the idea was to fly from both sides of the border so that when the work was shown, people would not know which side of the border we're on. So for example, in this case, we're on the Mexican side of the border. And then here we're on the US side of the border. And this actually happened five days apart. It's not, it's not even the same day that we, that we shot the same landscape. So it's very hard to know which side of the landscape you're on, unless I give you like one of the main clues, which is the US border patrol road. Uh, in Mexico, we don't have a, a border patrol. So we don't have roads for the border patrol. So the only trick to know which side of the border you're flying but on or you're standing on is through like the the road so in this case i don't know if you can see my my cursor but in this case this is a border patrol road and sometimes you see the actual cars on the on the road and this actually photograph where they always ask me in mexico we always think that the brown side is the mexican side and the green side is the u.s side uh, because of obvious economic uh, circumstances but in this case it's different in this case the green is the Mexico side and the brown is the US side and then it was very interesting to fly like that whole section of the border because you would learn what the actual border looks like like in this case sometimes it's just a white picket fence literally or sometimes it's just uh, just like a couple of poles put together so that there's some kind of division but if people could actually make it here walking it would be very easy to cross now we're on the US side in this photograph. So the only, the road that you see, it's actually the border patrol road. You don't see any roads on the Mexico side because there's no, no, no highways or no roads at all. And sometimes the border is uh, cut, you know, sometimes uh, in some of the terrain, like in this case, these mountains, these uh, mountains in the middle of the desert, uh, whomever was putting down the, the, the fence, would have had a very difficult time to do it going up the mountain too. So sometimes the, the wall or, or the border almost disappears completely or sometimes it actually disappears completely. And other times you encounter these weird, strange landscapes that are maybe uh, closer to what you would think the landscape of the moon looks like, but it's, it's still the, the border. And originally I had thought that I wasn't gonna show any cities because I didn't want to self-reference myself with the, the, maybe the project that had been, uh, oh, I think I'm running out of time, that, I, that, that had been one of my most popular projects. I didn't want to show the city anymore. I didn't want to show the cities, but then I thought about the importance of the city, of the US, of the Mexican border cities, like in this case, Mexicali or, or Tijuana, and how important they are to actually talk or open a conversation about the border. So it would be, uh, uh, I mean, I, 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 in the end, it didn't make sense to show this work and not show what the Mexican cities look like at the border. So that was Frontera. And then the second section, I think I might jump to, well, I'll try to do it very Pablo, quickly. sorry, yep. I'm sorry to interrupt everyone, but you have time. You have a good okay. 15 minutes, so don't, don't rush. All right. Don't worry. So I'll go a little bit maybe faster. And so the second section is called stones. And this is pretty much 
one of the maybe ideas or concepts that would describe most a lot of the projects that I have been working on uh, since the year 2012, when I decided that I was maybe going to leave landscape to the side, but then I did the border project. But anyways, but that I was going to try something different, and I was interested first in in photographing still in Mexico City, but then also in Latin America. And I was interested in the history of, of Latin America, the history of Mexico and the identity of Mexico. See how the history relates to contemporary times, how the, that history relates to today. And uh, I was also interested in, in working with archeology span because as you all know, no, it's, it's one of like, uh, the main subjects of maybe Mexican photography or photographers coming to Mexico, like Weston, of course, or Tina Modotti, or a lot of photographers who, who photograph the Mexican ruins. So I also did a landscape project about different archeological sites across Mexico. And uh, then I thought that I would maybe try to do something different with, within that same idea of, of archeology span and seeing how that archeology span or how that past can be seen in contemporary Mexico, or if it is only like an, an, like an invention of contemporary times to maybe try to have an identity. So I grabbed onto the symbols or the main symbols of pre-Columbian Mexico, the pyramids, the stairwells, the, the, these stairs going up the, the pyramids and see, seeing how it, how, where I could find it, how, where, where in, the, in, the, in the contemporary Mexican urban land, landscape, I could see or I could find this symbol or these symbols. In this case, uh, the actual um, sculptures that you could find in different pyramids. This is like the serpent with wings, Quetzalcoatl. And uh, in this case also, in this photo photograph in particular, it was, um, architectural movement or, or moment in the 50s in Mexico where they actually tried to bring back the Mexican symbols or the historical symbols to the present. So there's a lot of buildings in Mexico where you can find this, where you can find the actual gods in contemporary or in, in architecture from the 40s, 50s, like maybe this one too, which would be maybe after that, maybe from the 80s. And so sometimes it's a very direct reference and since sometimes it's something that was actually something that was um, uh, asked by the government, that the government wanted, that they had these uh, contests and this so that Mexico would be represented not only nationally but internationally through their history also. But in this case or this case, it's, it's just a symbol and I'm pretty sure that whomever did this wall was not directly thinking about representing the Mexican past, but it sometimes, but it, but it weirdly keeps appearing in different cities, in different places, in different uh, neighborhoods even. So it was also maybe just like a, a game that I was playing myself with the, the old geometries of pre-Columbian Mexico or the history and see how it was being represented. And I mean, as I kept working with the idea of geometry, with the idea of, of symbols, I also learned that it's, it's a very important subject matter in history of painting in Latin America in general, particularly in, in geometrical painters. So without me knowing, maybe I was also trying to get myself into that tradition. Some of the painters, of course, I'd seen while, while I was growing up. So these are a series of stairwells found in very different cities or different towns in uh, very far one from the other. And that was the first project that I worked on that had to do with the, pre with the past and its relationship with the present. Uh, in 2006, well, the dates are wrong, but from 2006 to 2017, I think I worked uh, with a similar idea working uh, specifically with the idea of the stone, uh, with, he, with the stone particularly like used in Incan architecture specifically in the 14th and 15th centuries. 
uh, of course, if you mean to Machu Picchu or to Cusco or a lot of the, or some of the archaeological sites in the Sacred Valley in Peru, you will see that these beautiful archaeological sites were all built with stones and stones that even today, it's hard to imagine how they were actually cutting down that stone into these very difficult angles to fit it together and to make it work as a wall or as a city. So it was kind of the same idea as with Pyramid that I was uh, working with this subject matter but in contemporary architecture. So all of these photographs that I'm showing are contemporary uh, walls. Walls also in different cities in Bolivia and in, in Peru specifically and in Bolivia, uh, but in, in different cities also in contemporary architecture. This is for example, the wall outside of a discotheque in a, in a town, in a city called Abancay in, in Peru. And this is a wall that uh, from just like a small town in, in Peru also. So this is just like a house, like a regular house. And um, if you walk around this small town that's called Oropesa, you see that a lot of the houses are built this way or at least decorated this way on the outside. So that's kind of the question that kept uh, coming up, uh, is this identity still part of us? Is our, is our history, is our past part of us in one way? Maybe it's, it's, maybe it comes out through our, our, our use of geometry, our architecture, or maybe it's just something that we want to grab onto and something that we're forcing on contemporary cities. So that was kind of the idea that I, that I, that I've worked with a lot, like the idea of identity and see if it's actually something that's true. If we belong to that identity, if we belong to that history, if it's just a social invention, a contemporary invention. And for example, in this photograph, we see one of the main symbols in Peru, which is the stone of the 12 or 14 angles. I'm, I, I don't, I'm blanking out if it's 12 or 14 angles, which is the main, maybe the, the main symbol of uh, Incan architecture this stone that was cut into uh, a lot of 12, like 12 or 14 different angles and then fit together with others. Of course, there's always uh, a reference in this work to maybe the American history of photography, maybe the 60s or 70s. Stephen Shore might maybe be one of the main influences of working the city, of how he was working maybe the city, even though of course he wasn't uh, dealing with history, with, with um, the idea of history or the concept of history. Uh, here's one more. This is almost like an abstract painting or geometrical painting that it would that you could pr probably find in from different painters in different collections of museums from maybe decades ago also. And then this is the last project that I'm going to show, and I can see that I still have some time. And this is. One of the last, well, at least the last project that I was exhibited and the last project that I, that has been printed as a book. So this is my last, uh, yeah, finished and shown project that's called Volcanic Stone. So again, it's very much about the stone. And this project was started as a commission, almost a commission for a museum in Mexico that's called El Eco or the Eco Museum in Mexico City, which is an experimental museum that doesn't usually show photography or almost never shows photography. It's more like a, like a very experimental museum. But uh, one day when I was uh, actually sitting down in a cocktail with one of the curators, he asked me to propose a project specifically for that museum. He said, why don't you propose to us a project that you could do within the next, the next year, year and a half, and then maybe we could show. And this, the idea was that the project had to be connected to the history of this museum which was built by Gerit, which is one of our main artists, architects that worked together with Barragan also, which was 40s, 50s, 60s in Mexico. So they wanted me to do a project that would relate to him or to that, to, to those decades, to the history of, of modern maybe architecture in Mexico. So after thinking about it for like, maybe like five or six months, I thought about working with the idea of the volcanic stone which is not only one of the most present elements or natural elements in uh, Mexico City's architecture through history, but it's also 
probably the main element for Mexican modernists, because when they when they built uh, the UNAM, which is our national university, or a town called Pedregal, it was literally built on top of volcanic stone and with volcanic stone. Oh, I mean, I, it was obviously a reference to California and uh, modernist architecture and how uh, it was built and in which spaces it was built. But here it was done on top of uh, volcanic stone because that's what we had surrounding the city because of the volcanoes that surround the city. Uh, so this is, for example, a photograph of an archaeological site in Mexico City that's called Cuicuilco. The, I forgot to change the title. But this is actually like a kind of like a pyramid. But if you go to Teotihuacan, there's also, it's also built with volcanic stone or with volcanic stones. So as I started working, I realized that not only the landscape of the volcano was present throughout pretty much the history of Mexican art, but the rock was present also in archeological sites, in the pyramids, in the churches in downtown Mexico, in the colonial towns uh, close to Mexico City or the colonial areas in Mexico City, and then also in modernism. So it, 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 from, one, well, from one symbol being the volcanic stone, it became a project about the history of Mexico City through its architecture. So uh, yeah, so I worked on the project for a little bit more than, than a year or maybe two years. And the exhibition happened last year. So this is Pedregal, a town in what we call Southern Mexico, uh, which was surrounded by volcanic stone. So the volcanic stone was used uh, in a lot of the facades of these houses. And, and not only that, but the stone became also a symbol of Mexico, like of Mexicanism in a way, because it kept on being used after modernism till, to, till today. And if you go to some of the uh, uh, some of the um, areas in Mexico, like maybe uh, Coyoacan or or well, other neighborhoods that are that were built with an idea also of Mexicanism or were kept together or have been developed within that idea, you see the stone being used still today also. So any new facade will maybe incorporate or will almost always incorporate also the volcanic stone. And here there's always also the reference again to the art that I was, to the geometric art or, or Latin American art that I grew up uh, looking at. Some other walls. So yeah, I, at some point I realized that I had maybe been working for five or six years with the idea of the stone or with the symbol of the stone, but just like in different places and without even noticing that that was one of the main subjects that I had been working on for the last uh, couple of years. And it's something that I, that I plan to keep on doing maybe uh, in different countries, maybe, you know, where there's still, where there was a still like a strong pre-Columbian history too. So it's actually the wall, the outer wall of a church in downtown Mexico. And most of the wall, most of the churches are also built with bricks made out of volcanic stone. And these are two, uh, views of the exhibition space. Uh, I mean, as I was saying, Eleco Museum is an ex it's a, a experimental museum. It's very tall. It doesn't look as tall here, but it's a very tall museum. So, and the walls are usually not uh, used. They don't like to 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 put um, yeah to hang things on the walls. It's usually like a big gallery with sculpture or sound installations, and the walls are usually white also and but they are they let, they allowed me to do it and to do like an actual classic photography exhibition and uh i asked them to paint the, the the ceiling and the walls with a gray color that would maybe be close to the gray color of the volcanic stone and then the show was that there were maybe 51 photographs i think just running through the whole wall of the museum that would also maybe make a reference to the landscape which after all is what this project is about too, no? like the urban landscape of Mexico or the landscape of the volcano. And there's a small, uh, there was a small room right next to this that I, where I actually for the first time showed some of the work that I had been seeing since I was a child. So this was 
uh, rare books or prints or drawings from these artists that have been working with the idea of the volcano or representing the volcano from the 30s on in Mexico. And this was all work that my father actually lent to me. And it was also like a small cure, uh, cure, um, cure, uh, curat, curat, curatory, curat. Well, it was, it was a selection that I made myself and, and there was an, in a way like showing what, where I was coming from. So it's, it was a small room that, where you could see all the references that in a way made this project happen also, but it was like something that I looked, that I've been looking at for 30 years of my life or more and that I will continue, uh, continue to look at in, for the future, no? with, thanks to the re relationship with my father. So I, I hope that was clear. I, yeah, I don't know if that was very clear at the end, but anyways, thank you for this, listening to me for 45 minutes. I hope <laughs> you enjoyed it and that it was- clear. So interesting, I'm such a fan. Thank you oh, so much, that was yeah. amazing. Um, we, we have some really great questions already coming in. Excellent. So please, um, please ask away and I will sort of moderate this. Um, the question that I had, and it was actually better stated by someone else, so I'm gonna use his words. This is from David. Um, he says that you met in the, at a 10 by 10 photo book project. Okay. Yeah, in New Mexico about four yeah, years yeah. ago. Maybe um, more, yeah. He's uh, asking, does your new work also have a photo book, artist book element as well? And are you also still making artist books? I uh, feel like your work really lends itself to the book form really well, because there's so much, you know, series and patterns and things. So talk about your books a little bit. Yeah, I mean, hi, David. Of course, I, I remember you. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, yeah, I mean, Obviously, I think today it's almost it's 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 almost impossible to start working on a new project and not think about how the project will look in an exhibition one and then also how it would look as a book in the future. No, so of course, I mean the first thing that I think about is the actual project and what I want to work with, and then as as a as a project starts building and I start seeing the prints and the actual work and the film being developed, then one of the first things that I think about is. First, maybe how the work would look if it was exhibited. And then of course, how the book would look uh, in a book. So I'm always, uh, particularly when I, especially when the, when the projects are finished, I'm always thinking of how this would look in book format or how it would look as a book. And uh, I, I'm, I'm sometimes working on dummies, sometimes I'm not working on dummies. In the end, the books that I've, published previously which are already I think five or six books in the end they've they I've always given control to the designer even though I have my own ideas but many times I just have given control sometimes maybe I've had a little bit of regret but sometimes it's always I, I, I mean I felt that it's also good to not try to control absolutely everything so yeah I have at least maybe four or five projects that have not been published that it, that I may have like some at least maquettes maybe in my mind or and or I'll are always thinking about talking to designers who could maybe have like uh, come up with an idea for for these projects. So yeah, I mean it's I think now it's very important to think about books. There's so much photography. There's so many photographers that it's very hard even having the publication to get your your work across. I, I don't know if that was the question or if I went. But. <laughs> By the way, books available on Amazon.com. Yes. <laughs> and and through RM Editorial, who now finally, after decades, uh, have like an online uh, store where you can buy all their books. They have really good books. Oh, that's good to know. RM yeah. Editorial. Yeah. That's great. I think most most of four of my books, I think, are are there. Are there. Some, I think only one of them is out of print. Okay. Um, we have okay. a question from Yiwei about your interest in the square format. You seem to use the square format a lot, and in wondering why you're interested in that particularly i, I mean I've, I've been asked that before and it's interesting because it was pretty much through learning that i came up like, that i came to the square format i was shooting with obviously 35 millimeters as a younger photographer and then at some point i bought like a classic roliflex camera which is i think one of the cameras that uh, a lot of photographers run through when they're going uh when they're experimenting with, with different formats 
and then um, maybe the main influence was Gracieli to be this square work, or maybe Robert Adams also, which was uh, also like an eye opener for me. And I think that's the first time that I said, I want to start shooting with a square format, but I only used it for the first three projects. So it was like Terrazzo, Natura, and then Acapulco. After that, I haven't worked with the square format anymore. It's actually close to the square format, but it's six by seven. And so maybe the first five or six years I was working with the square format. And then I changed to the, to this other format, which is six by seven, which is similar. And it's actually the same camera, but it's only like only the format changes. And also uh, when I start again, I going back, like uh, when I started working with landscape, I also realized that it was interesting to shoot the landscape in the square format because throughout the history that I had been looking at, and even with, all photographers or most photographers, there's very few that were actually shooting the landscape with a square format. It, it, it almost goes against the idea of the landscape or the classic idea of the landscape. Also the vertical, um, uh, shooting vertically when you're not using the square format also would almost go against the idea of how the landscape should be shown. And it was, it was comfortable and I, I, of course, it was the first project that I shot on that format, so I liked how it looked and I just kept going for maybe five or six years. And then with the, with the, with the project after that, I thought that it did, it wouldn't make that much sense. Fair enough. Um, we have a question from Douglas. Um, he says, I love that you often feel the need to escape previous projects to not repeat yourself. You mentioned this a few times, a couple of times, or even look like you might be repeating yourself, aerials and landscapes, etc. Do you have any comment? Yeah, definitely. It was, it was probably one of the first, uh, I think, important decisions that I made for my own work because the aerial photographs of Mexico City were, were I mean, this was 2006 and by 2007 they had opened up, opened doors for me. Uh, even like in a gallery in New York at Sasha Wolf Gallery where I had my first uh, individual exhibition back in 2007 or I, maybe it was the end of 2006. And this work was published in books and magazines. And for a lot of years, it was the, the work that they were always be asking to show from me. So it would have been maybe a, a commercial strategy to keep on working within that work uh, or doing that same work because it would have probably worked uh, to make sales and to, and to maybe get the work, this, this new work across. But I, I mean, I, I guess the most important thing, and, I'm, and I say this, like I completely mean this, is as an artist, you have to always question what you're doing. And I think that repeating yourself, and you can see it with, with artists sometimes, you know, repeating yourself is sometimes uh, the worst idea because then you can never move away from that unless you're Joseph Alvarez, one of the greatest artists who, who made it his, his um, that was his, his life, you know, working on, the square for, for, for 30 or 30 something years of his career. In my case, no, I knew that I didn't want to do aerial photographs for the rest of my life. In, in, and now I think it, it was maybe like a smart decision because now with, with the drones and with uh, so many young photographers and not so young photographers working with drone, now it became like almost just like a very typical strategy you can find across like new or young photographers. So yeah, I, I think it was, something that I always thought about, like not repeating myself and something that the people that I trust would tell me, like, don't go back to, to that. No, yeah. Do you wish you had drones? You had to go through so much hassle to uh, get the helicopter and the plane. Uh -huh. <laughs> De definitely not. Definitely not. I think I, I'm still, I guess, old school because I learned photography in a cla the, the way, the classic manner. I, I learned photography by developing my own film, printing my own photographs, there was no digital. I think I was actually, my generation was the first generation that had to, this, this conversation or this discussion between digital and analog photography. And a lot of us, a lot of us stayed with, it, with analog photography like I did. But also, I think the actual experience of doing these projects is what mattered maybe more than actually coming up with the photographs. Like flying over the border on the first uh, flight that we did, the, that first flight that didn't work out at all photographically, I was flying with an ex-military from Mexico who was flying this guy's helicopter. So he knew all the tricks. 
he had been uh, flying uh, military helicopters for his for 10 years or 20 years so at some point we landed i mean when you fly in a helicopter you can only land in in actual airports you can't land anywhere else but specific spaces like in in in, air, in specific airports and we landed pretty much in the middle of the Sinaloa, no, not Sinaloa, in the, well, let's say the Sinaloa desert in Mexico, where we couldn't be, that, that's illegal actually, but you know, it's Mexico and it was an ex-military, so we have all the good things together. And <laughs> so we were actually flying with, with, uh, with, with tanks of gasoline inside the helicopter, which is also very illegal. Mm. So we landed so we could put more gasoline in the helicopter. And when we landed, it was by far the most isolated, silent, space that i've ever been in my life like we landed there also because the the what do you call the the the, the system not bluetooth but wasn't working so you you actually had no phones you had no no way to communicate with anyone if something would have happened we would have stayed there forever like we would have probably died because there were no roads and no one knew we were there mm. and you could just see this empty harsh landscape and imagining as a Mexican what people have gone through historically just to try to make some money for their family. So that experience and actually flying through the border myself and looking at it and landing and going up again is probably much more important than that, the work that came from it. So no, experience for me is very important. Or in that sound, somebody's at my door. Um, Sort of on that same, along that same uh, line, another question from Doug here. You talked about when you shot this, the border, did you zigzag across? You talked about shooting one side and the other. Uh -huh. Did yeah. you zigzag across? And did you consider that a transgressive or political act? I, I, when I started planning the project, I thought that it was impossible to do it. <laughs> I thought that there would be no way that, uh, that both governments uh, would allow us to fly next to the border for for, 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 I mean, how many miles was that? I don't know it in miles, but it was a lot of terrain. And so, yeah, of course, I thought that maybe in, in Mexico we could find a way to do it and that would be transgression because in Mexico almost always you can find a way to do it. So, yeah, of course, I thought that it would be, uh, yeah. And, and then what I found out is that it's actually not difficult at all and that the rules on the U.S. side are much um, easier than on the Mexican side. Because in the U.S., if you're flying in a helicopter, as long as you let the other person know where you're going to be landing, they're fine with it. They're not going to ask you any more questions. And uh, for example, if you land in a Mexican airport, the military can come into your helicopter. So as long as soon as you land, you see the military coming to the to your to your helicopter, and maybe not actually going in, but definitely staring in and maybe asking you to show them a bag or something. Whereas in the U.S. side, it's illegal, so they can't. Um, well, I don't know if it's illegal, but they don't. Uh, the military doesn't come and, and inspect your your helicopter. So it was very interesting. The only thing that that was that we weren't able to do was fly through a territory next to the border on the U.S. side, in Arizona. That's uh, a military base camp, and where they do experiments. So or so that was the only. So at some point we had to like fly away from the border and then go back to the border. So yeah, there were. I mean, and then. Yeah, uh, when we flew from El Paso to, no, sorry, from Ciudad Juarez to El Paso, we had to ask for special permission just because we were flying at night. So they usually, I think, from what I learned, don't allow small helicopters or small uh, to, to fly across the border at night. So it's just, a, it's not something very difficult, but we asked for permission and they allowed it. So we were flying from one of like the main drug towns in Mexico City inside to El, to El Paso, Texas, and when we landed, there wasn't anyone checking the helicopter. We just walked out, went to customs, uh, went through customs, and no one checked the helicopter or the bags that we left at the helicopter. So it was like an eye opener, also. No, it, it was. I mean, that was. I thought, yeah, I thought that that was like a big, big thing to learn about with the issues that we have with uh, drugs. And we flew on one side all the way from Tijuana to um, Ciudad Juarez. Then we crossed to El Paso and flew all the way back to, to San Diego. We could have flown across, but it would have done it very difficult when we went back into Mexico because that's when it became a little bit more complicated. You have to have a lot of documents 
And of course, you never have the, doc, uh, the documents that they originally asked for. And you have to, you know, find your way through the Mexican customs. So, so it, would be, it would have been difficult. So no, we went all the way straight from one side and then to the other. And then I did one last flight months after that, uh, just on the US side. So it was from San Diego to Arizona and then back. So interesting. I mean, here in California, we're, I think in the States, we're obsessed with the border a little bit. It's, there's a yeah. lot of talk about the border. We're here in California, we are a border state and we're, um, you know, it's a lot of, it's uh, also a very Mexican city, Los Angeles. So yeah. uh, did you get a lot of attention about this series and, and after Trump started talking about, or giving his attention to the border, did how did that impact your conversations about this? Yeah, I mean, it was almost immediate also. I mean, I think we were, we, I mean, you were, the, we were there in, in Parry Poto in when Trump became elected. I think we actually met the day after her, two days yes, after her. And everyone was just like sh in a shocked state. I'm sorry if there's any Trump uh, followers yeah. in this chat. Okay. <laughs> but <laughs> but uh, yeah, I mean, the issue about the border and how and he, he made it part of his campaign, of course, it wasn't only after he became elected. So, but the book uh, came out literally at Paris Photo when uh, Trump became elected. So weeks after that, uh, I, was, uh, I was asked for the images or for like an interview by maybe a US uh, newspaper or magazine, Mexico, Europe. So yeah, it was one of those projects that the circumstances around it you know, helped it uh, to to become, I guess, more relevant at that time in particular. Yeah, we just have a couple more like appreciations as the border uh, as landscape and uh, um, some fan notes here. Um, so we'll move away from the border. Um, when you did the stones project, mm -hmm. uh, you referred to it as a landscape project, but it seems this is from Roger who mm -hmm. I hope you've met also, Roger Hill. Yeah. Um, but it seems to me you became a very good architectural photographer. Do you ever think of yourself in that context? Uh, uh, in, I mean, in a way, because when I'm describing my work, I guess sometimes the easiest way to describe it also is that I'm working with architecture. And I've done projects that I didn't show here, but I did a couple of projects that are very much uh, architecturally um, directed. So one of architecture in Bolivia, and then one that I just finished uh, of architecture in Cuba also. Well, not architecture, but uh, uh, like a section of the, of like a specific uh, architecture in Cuba. So yeah, I mean, I've, I've never done commercial work, for example, uh, for anything, but not, on, not for architecture either. And, but I've also, but yeah, I mean, yeah, I, I, I guess my work could definitely fit into that category and I, and I don't have any I'm happy to consider myself also an architecture photographer. I mean, there's, it's about history and architecture, especially in Latin America, it's about, it's, I mean, it's, it's the history, you know, and of, of Latin America, it's there. I mean, we still have the ruins, you know, and we have the churches and we have contemporary architecture. Mm -hmm. um, I was struck by the comment you made about investigating identity through the landscape and, and through architecture. I mean, you see a lot of artists working um, with, you know, conceptions of identity, but that seems to me kind of a unique uh, approach. Uh, we have another question here uh, about, uh, maybe you can answer this about a connection in building design between Mexicanism and Frank Lloyd Wright's organic architecture. Is that something you feel like you can answer? I, I mean, I'm, I'm of course no expert, but uh, I think, yeah, I mean, I think it was, of, I mean, Mexican modernism came from the modernist architectures in the U.S. That's where the influence came from. Of course, California, Frank Lloyd Wright, you know, so it was obviously an, an influence. And at that time, uh, there were a lot of artists from outside of Mexico who were also coming to Mexico and found some influence in, in this same pre-Columbian uh, architecture. Joseph Albers, who I mentioned earlier, uh, uh, Annie Albers, of course, and her textiles, amazing textiles and I mean a lot of it is is, is was influenced by um, pre-Columbian ancient textiles so yeah I mean there's uh, Frank Lloyd's right architecture which I would love to photograph so if anyone has a connection I would 
really appreciate it. But I think it was that. I mean, you know, like two different uh, communities feeding from each other or, or mostly the U.S. maybe coming to Mexico and, and having like different influences from their own history. And then Mexico trying to work with that same uh, influence, the American influence. But I'm no expert. So, I, I mean, I don't know if there's something more specific about the, the, that question that I could maybe, yeah. You know, we have a few Frank Lloyd Wright uh, homes here in Los Angeles. You should come. Mm -hmm. Yeah, <laughs> definitely. And you know, there's that beautiful Mayan uh, theater, you know? Yes. That's still up and still running, you know? And I would love also to, to photograph it. So for Never example, that would be too like, like a very, very nice, uh, if I ever exhibited the work and I could include that within like the pyramid project, that would be great also. So it will happen at some point for sure. Yeah. Post we were able to travel again. Yes. <laughs> yes. Um, I have just a couple more here um, about your choice to print in black and white. Um, mm. You, for the last, for the, El e um, I'm calling it the El Echo project. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, um, volcanic stone. Well, thank you, Pedro's yeah. Volcanicas. Why did you choose to print in black and white? And in general, do you have a preference about how, what are your feelings about color in black and white? Ah, uh, well, I, I I love this question because I, mo I if I were to choose my favorite photographers, probably most of them would be black and white photographers. And when I started working in two thousand six, I was immediately drawn towards. Uh, even though I, before that I had been working black and white and uh, developing and printing my own material. When I was studying in NYU, I was drawn towards color photography and I could also do it all by myself. I mean, I was shooting analog, but I was printing digital. So it became very comfortable to be able to, in a way, one, dominate your own craft and be able to, to, to follow it from the beginning to the end. And, but I, and I mean, and a, a lot of my influences at that time, like American photographers, like uh, Eggleston, of course, Stephen Shore, Tristan Berry, Jan Mark Bustamante, like uh, uh, the Germans, Thomas Struth, Thomas Roth, um, Gursky. There were the influence that I, the work that I was looking at at that time that I was most amazed by. So I guess it was also that influence. But 14 years or 13 years went by from my first project to Piedra or to Volcanic Stone. And I always thought about coming up with a project that I could shoot in black and white. Mm -hmm. So since I started, I always said, I want to shoot in black and white and I want to photograph it analog and, and have actually like silver gelatin prints as the end project, the product, not uh, digital prints. So it's always that something that I always had in my mind. And I remember whenever I spoke to photographers who worked in black and white, I always said, I'm so jealous that you're working in black and white. I, I wish I would come up with a project that was in black and white. And when I thought about the stone originally for that, I was thinking about a very different project that would be shot in color. And then at some point I said, you know, if, if you're going to reference history, why not also reference it in the actual media, like shooting in negative and printing and showing silver, silver gelatin prints, which are considered like, you know, from the past maybe already. So, so it was, it, it all fit together, it all worked together. And the stone, I think looks beautiful in black and white. So, yeah. so yeah, it was something that I always had been wanting to do. Yeah. Very interesting. Okay, one last um, question. This is back to the aerial work. Um, this is from Roger. He says, your aerial photographs seem very abstract mm -hmm. to me also, but they seem to contain the infinite. Many, many houses, many, many people, much people within the finite landscape photo itself. Do you view your work as abstract or is it complex representational? I would say, yeah, representational. Yeah, more than abstract, definitely. But I mean, what you're saying is, is, is I, I found so true since the beginning because uh, the aerial photographs, when I was showing them, people would, would say, oh, that's so beautiful. And maybe the photographs that no, were not aerial, they would be like, oh, why are you photogra photographing like this side of Mexico City? What, like, why would you want to shoot like this uh, landscape? This... Mm -hmm. So I think it became very, I think those photographs are, are abstract, but very graphic also. Mm -hmm. So I guess, people see it maybe more, or, or, or some people see it more like as a very graphic image, uh, maybe even closer to our own understanding of, of maybe painting or, or graphic art. And maybe that's because it's not, maybe that's the reason why it's not as, as um, strong as what it's actually showing. But then that work, 
on the other hand, has gone all over uh, for like all kinds of magazines. We're talking about globalization, overgrowth, mm -hmm. uh, ecologic issue, ecolo yeah, ecological issues, uh, political issues, social issues. So it's had its own like outside of maybe the art world. It had it's had like it's like the specific reading that I was giving it to it, which is more, I guess, representing what was happening in Mexico City or what is happening in Mexico City every day, no? And yeah. Mm -hmm. um, we have a comment saying that must have been so wonderful to see all those prints in the in the gallery in El, in El Echo. Uh, yeah, and I, I am here to tell you that it was, because I saw it. Yeah, he saw it. <laughs> yeah. yeah, it was a really terrific yeah. exhibition. Uh, it's a Thank unique you. space and it was uh, it was really beautiful. No, uh, just like a little, like a short story that, yeah. that I think it's interesting also for that. For me, it was a, an important exhibition because when I was working in the US, the Echo Museum had like a short run as, a, as an actually experimental museum. It opened up in the 60s or maybe even earlier than that, but it only lasted as a museum for maybe five or six years. And then it was closed down and it became a disco, uh, then a bar, then it was a theater, then it, it was just like an occupied space. And then at some point, the National University bought it back or got it back from whoever owned it. And it became a museum again. And it opened up in 2005, if I'm not mistaken, or 2006. So when I was coming back from New York, it was one of the first, I went to the opening of, the, of this space. And I remember being, uh, I mean, what they were showing was, contemporary Mexican art. And I remember walking in and saying, I, I, this is an, an, an amazing space. I wish I could do an exhibition here mm -hmm. at some point. So yeah, it happened uh, er, earlier than I thought it would be able to. Right? I actually never thought it would happen because they don't show uh, that works on wall that often, only in a small room that they have upstairs. Mm -hmm. So it was, it was fantastic to not only, I mean, I liked, I loved how the exhibition looked, but actually being able to show it in that place that I had really um you willed it into existence yeah <laughs> yeah <laughs> like i'm doing the same thing with covid every day you know just like yes yes will, yeah wishing it to in existence yeah yes um if people want to learn more or contact you what's yeah. the best way uh my email uh which is my name as it appears on the screen which is pablo lopez luz Mm -hmm. at gmail.com let me see if I can whoop, well. or yeah or it's in my website also so my oh, website okay. is also my name pablolopezluz.com okay and yeah some of my books are if anyone's interested they're in Amazon or I think photo I might have like maybe st still a copy or two and oh yeah photo I are, are in editorial of um... I'm trying to quickly jump to my name just so that it's Okay. <laughs> uh, I think people may be starting, may, uh, may need to peel off uh, and go to other things, but I think some may be interested to know how, um, how COVID is impacting Mexico City and, and the country. Yeah, it's a, it's a, that's a, yeah, that's an interesting and difficult subject because uh, the government that we have right now, uh, which is kind of like left socialist Latin American government, which doesn't mean left or socialist, but it's just a little bit they're kind of like the same of what we had before. Uh, they've been really, really terrible about dealing with pretty much all the important situations in Mexico, beginning with economy and then of course COVID. So uh, yeah, they made a very, very. They've been making a very bad job dealing with with it, and we have a very complicated society that's not, uh, unfortunately, as educated or that does not have access to media uh, as much as you would want. So, probably the the what they follow is what the president is saying, who's like an immensely popular figure. Like it's very similar to Trump in a way. So, uh, so what what the president says is what the people follow, especially uneducated. Um, uh, and I don't say this in any like, uh, you know, like a derogative. bad way. I don't, yeah, the derogative, derogative way, no. And and he st since the beginning he said that it wasn't really an issue. At some point he pulled out like some religious figures saying that that's would what protect what would protect uh, the Mexican people and the, the beauty and the magnificency of Mexican culture would be able to deal with the virus, whatever. So a lot of people didn't take 
care they didn't familiar with uh, that kind of narrative yeah it's very it's actually a very similar narrative like bolsonaro uh uh boris johnson in the uk maybe trump and mexico and so yeah i mean for the last maybe month we've just been having more and more uh, people being infected by the virus and and deaths and nobody knows when it's gonna stop one day they say uh, and the government's really bad with information so one day they say okay we're, we're good we can go out into the streets again and then two weeks after that we have to close ourselves in again mm -hmm. so yeah it's it's not a good time and and no, nobody really knows what it's going to happen and it's very unfortunate that our government is dealing with it this way you know but, i mean we have for mexico city one like close to a hundred million people already losing their no wait what am i saying like a million people losing their jobs in the last month and then the poverty line is is, is growing every day and we it, it seems like at least with the numbers that we have in mexico we'll have up to like 60 or 70 percent of uh, a poor population when this is over if not 75 or more so mm -hmm. yeah it's it, yeah it's not it's not the best time Good. but visit mexico it's <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. Maybe next year. Maybe next, <laughs> Maybe year. next year. Yeah. Maybe next year. Yeah. Oh my gosh. Okay. Well, we're getting a few thank yous and um, thank you from me. I really appreciate you doing this for us. This was a great presentation. It's um, you know this time is really challenging in a lot of ways, but it has given us the opportunity to have conversations with people who aren't uh, in LA, and it's really been terrific. And I'm really appreciative of you taking this time to to spend with us. Yeah. Well, it was it was great. Thank you, Paula. Also, like I told you some days uh, ago, like it's it's been so silent in general. I think for most photographers, you know, like these times where you're like not only at your house but also there's not that much happening. So it was great to. I mean, I can't see anyone. It would have been nice to have a conversation looking at at people. Well, but uh, but I mean, yeah, it's great to, to to think about your photography again and be able to talk about it with people. So thanks for the invitation and thanks for to everyone that joined. Great, great. All right. Well, you know, watch your email. We have lots of interesting things coming up. Yeah. We will um, see you all again next time. And yeah, uh, happy weekend, everyone. And I hope everyone's very safe as well as the families. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Bye, everyone. Bye.